So turn with me to Psalm chapter 19, Psalm 19, and we'll be finishing what we began last week. Psalm 19, and we'll start in verse 7 and go through the end of the chapter. If you remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, um, the first angle that Satan used to tempt Jesus was his belly, uh, and he use that as a, a way to get Jesus to use his power uh, in, a, in a selfish way, in a self-serving way. Uh, but he used Jesus' belly. Uh, we see this in Matthew 4, 1 through 4, for instance, where, where the scripture says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Uh, I can barely go four hours and not be hungry, right? Forty days and forty nights. That would be an intense hunger, right? He, he was hungry. So you can see then how appealing this temptation might be. Matthew 4, uh, continuing in verse 2. Uh, After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, this is Jesus speaking. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, we probably have heard that phrase before, right? Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus knows, right? He's he's saying something there about the importance. Bread may be important, but God's word is more important. And he's actually quoting that there. That is scripture that he is quoting. And it comes from Deuteronomy 8.3, in case you want to know where that comes from. Uh, and there, Moses is talking about the man in the wilderness uh, and the, God's purpose in it. And as we hear the words of Jesus, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, we kind of, I think we nod along acknowledging like, yeah, that's, that's good, that's true, there's wisdom in that. But I wonder how much we actually believe it to be true. Right? We nod along saying it is true, but do we actually believe it? And so I ask this not to guilt yourself. I don't ask this to uh, make you feel guilty. But if you do feel guilty, maybe that's the Holy Spirit trying to get your attention. Uh, but, but rather so you can gauge yourself. What does the amount and quality of time that you spend in God's word tell you about how much you actually value it? So how much does, what does the amount, so the amount of time, In the quality of time that you spend in God's word, tell you about how much you value it. Because we spend time on things that we value. We make time for the things that are important. Where does the word of God fit into your life? If it is true that man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, then we best know it. We best study it. We best seek it out. And if the word of God is as David David describes here in our passage today, we best heed it. So what I want us to, what is underscoring our passage today is this. The word of God applied transforms our lives. The word of God applied transforms our lives. So I want to see that in this passage today, starting in Psalm Uh, 19 chapter 7 verse 7 even chapter 19 verse 7 the scripture says the law of the lord is perfect reviving the soul the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple the precepts of the lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the lord is pure enlightening the eyes the fear of the lord is clean enduring forever the rules of the lord are true and righteous altogether More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. 
Right? This psalm is a psalm about the glory of God, and it's about the revelation of God. And so uh, when last we met in the first half, we see how all of creation sings, all of creation shouts, it speaks, it, it declares, it professes, it proclaims, it pours out about the glory of God. The creation around us, the earth around us, the sky above us, all declares God's glory. Not its own glory, but God's glory. And indeed, the song of creation goes forth and touches every corner of this creation, right? Every, every corner of this earth, every person on this earth, if they look and listen, will see something of the glory of God. And today, as we contemplate the word declaring the glory of God, we must recognize that we too need this. It's not enough that we hear creation. We also need to hear from God directly. Because creation only gives us part of the question, part of the answer to the question, part of the, part of the solution to the problem. It's not enough that we hear creation. We need more than general revelation. We also need special revelation, God's word. And we want to remind ourselves that our passage is written to whom? The Jewish people, right? This is a psalm, this is a song that the Jewish people would sing. And so we see reference in it, uh, especially to the law of God. Whom did the law come to? The Jewish people. And so while all creation may hear the call of the creator, it was to the Jewish people alone that God revealed his name. And so it is to they, uh, to them, that have the highest duty in seeking God. Um, Paul tells us as much in Romans chapter 3, Romans 3 verses 1 and 2, that in what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? To which Paul responds, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, with the glory of God. And so they have a double duty to uh, seek after God. But not just them. We too today, who have the word of God, must recognize its worth, must glory in the one whom it reveals. So let us turn to our passage, and I want us to first see in verses 7 to 9, the perfect word, the perfect word, 7 to 9. So David sings, right? This is a song of David. David writes, the law of the Lord is perfect. And as we go through a, a, a general note here, right, to get started in this section, David uses a variety of words that mean close to the same thing. And we might seek to say, well, what is, what is the, the, the little bit of nuance in this word versus that word? Uh, and I think we would be going down a grammatical rabbit trail that doesn't actually produce much fruit. Why? Because again, remember, what is this? This is a song. And what is this song uh, a, a genre of? Poetry, right? What do you do in poetry? Use synonyms. Why do you use synonyms? Because so that way you can say, uh, give a look, maybe give a little different flavor, give a little different nuance. But if you're just singing the same words uh, over and over again, what do you have? Contemporary Christian music. There's the there's the joke, right? Uh, um, but but right. So so we we don't want to press too far and say. Well, David says law and testimony and precepts and commandment and fear and rules and all these are different things. They're not. He's talking about one main thing. Now, what is that main, one main thing? Well, predominantly, we would understand him to be referring to the law, the law of Moses. Right? That's what he's talking about. Right? As we start out here, the law of the Lord. That's going to have a, a, key, a coded key phrase. For any Jewish person, they, they're going to know what the law is, and the law is the law of Moses. But what he describes here in this passage is much more than just the law of Moses. It encompasses the covenants, uh, especially going back before the, the covenant he made uh, at Mount Sinai, the covenant he made with Abraham. 
So when we're talking about here the law, the testimony, the commandments, let us think of this more broadly as the whole counsel of God. This is all of his word. This is God's word, God's commands. Uh, and understand too, right, it's not just the Old Testament that has commandments. The New Testament has commandments too. Right? So sometimes we get this idea that well, the Old Testament is all law and do this and don't do this. And then the New Testament, we're free as a bird, do whatever we want. Right? No, that's not true. Right? We're not reading our Bibles if, we're, if we think that. So we need to uh, understand there's commandments in both. And so we, we need to attend to both. But, so that's the first kind of general thing we have to understand. The second is the nature of the word of God and especially the law. And so this is a question we, I want us to answer now and not later. But is the law a good thing? Is the law a good thing? Are God's commands a good thing? Well, David here writes, right, the law of the Lord is perfect, right? And what do we mean by perfect there? It wants for nothing. Uh, it needs nothing. All that is needed for wise living is contained therein. And wise living is living in light of the commandments of God. And indeed, what does he say here of the law of the Lord is perfect? What does it do? It revives the soul. It restores the soul. Or does it crush the soul? Right, we might remember what Paul says about the law in Romans chapter 7, verse 10. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. So part of, the, part of our struggle, part of what I'm uh, pulling out here, and maybe we've never struggled with this, um, or maybe we have. Maybe we've read through the book of Romans and kind of come away with this question is, is God's word really good? Is God's commands really good? Is David wrong to extol the law when the law leads to death the law condemns us because the law proves what we are a sinner and yet paul goes on in romans 7 and verse 12 to say this of the law so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good and so paul held these two things in tensions that he understood that the law brought about his death, in a sense, because it revealed to him his sin. And he says there in Romans 7, when the law told me not to covet, the, I, I started coveting in all sorts of ways. It just opened up a Pandora's box of coveting. But then he also says that the law is holy, right? It's a righteous thing. It's a good thing. And so at, our out, at the very outset here, right, as we begin to understand what David writes we have to confess that we need another we must confess our complete inability to stand upon the word of god of our own accord right we have to confess that which is uh, written in second corinthians five twenty one. right we need to understand what is meant by this and so i want us to unpack this for us a moment and then apply it to our situation here right second corinthians five twenty one. for our sake for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? Paul writes here to the Corinthian church and he says there's an exchange that has taken place. The Lord Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin. So let's stop and contemplate that further. What does it mean that Jesus knew no sin? It means that he is perfect. Jesus is perfect it means he has always done what the father has required of him when god the father says jesus do this he does it how many of us can say that of our earthly fathers i'll get to that when i want to or no i'm not doing that Everything, though, that Jesus heard from the Father, he did. Jesus never missed the mark. He never spoke amiss. 
He never did anything wrong. He never even thought amiss. So stop and and consider that question. How long can you go without thinking a sinful thought? Such sinners that we are, we can't even go a day. Such sinners that we are, and I don't want to press too too deep into this because I think there's more at work. But even in our dreams at night when we're unconscious, we sin. Again, I don't want to press that too far. There are those who are costed by by dreams of evil things that are outside of their control. So I'll just say that, pause that. But we can't go a day without thinking a sinful thought. But Jesus never sinned in his thoughts, never sinned in his words, and he never sinned in what he did. The author of Hebrews tells us of Jesus in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And see, that's the reality too, right? With, with Jesus, our great high priest, it wasn't just that he is perfect. And it wasn't just as though he went through this life, his earthly life, never being tempted. Right? We might say that. We might put, put ourselves in that position and say, you know, if I just didn't have the temptations around me, if I wasn't tempted, I wouldn't sin. Because then I'd be like Jesus. But do you realize Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, and yet he was without sin? Go back and read in Matthew 4, where Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. Jesus has been fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and he's hungry. He was tempted with food. How many of us wouldn't uh, take the opportunity, if we had the power, just to say, bread? Or more likely, you know, donuts, cheesecake, chocolate chip cookies, right? Everywhere. Just turn a tree, every leaf to, into a chocolate chip cookie, right? The best ones. Jesus was tempted without sin. So go back to Paul uh, in Second Corinthians. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God, right? So for our sake, let's let's think here, right? For the sake of God's people, Jesus Christ, who never sinned, was made to be sin. And this is to say that to him was imputed the guilt of sinners. Christ Jesus bore the sin of his people. That on the cross, Jesus suffered not for his sins, but for ours. That God attributed to Jesus, in a sense, our sin when he poured out his wrath on him on the cross. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Why? To what end? So that. And this is the purpose, right? Paul writes, this is, this is the purpose. That's a, that's a purpose, logical purpose statement. Right, so that. What for? So that. We might become the righteousness of God. So here's the exchange. Christ receives our sin, and we receive Christ's righteousness. Imputed to us is the righteousness of Christ Jesus when we call out to him in faith. When we believe in the work and person of Jesus, we are saved from our sins in this manner. An exchange happens. So it is now that we appear as one who is holy, blameless, and above reproach. This Christ did. So we go back to this issue of the law. The very commandment that promised the life proved to be death to me, Paul says. But the law is good. And Christ fulfilled the law. And in Christ's fulfilling of the law, we have hope. That which promises our death does so no longer. The fangs of the law are removed because we have been granted the righteousness of Christ. And this, brothers and sisters, 
is your great hope. This is the message of the gospel. But what then purpose does the law, the commandments hold for us? Why, why should we study the law? Why should we care about what we see in the Old Testament? Well, Paul writes to his protege, his son in the faith, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. These are not new verses. These weren't added last week. There wasn't a patch to the Bible. These have been here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture, all scripture. What scripture is Paul writing about? The Old Testament. That's all the scripture that there is. In Paul's day. Now we have the New Testament. But it doesn't mean we throw out the Old Testament. Because all scripture is breathed out by God. Inspired by the Holy Spirit we might say there. And profitable for what? For casting on the fire to keep us warm. For keeping our bookshelves full. No for teaching. For reproof. For correction. And for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The law is perfect. It revives the soul. It's sure. Look at the second part there to verse 7 of Psalm 19. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's certain. It's reliable. And what does it do? It makes the simple wise. The testimony of the Lord trains us. It equips us for every good work. It's profitable for us. So what's a reason you need the word of God in your life every day, beloved? Because it prepares you for the works that God has set out for you. Because it makes you wise. And as we saw in James's letter, when we study through that, right? What does wisdom get us? The crown of life. It enables us to face the various trials that we meet, the various kinds of trials that we endure. We're able to endure because of wisdom. David continues, the precepts of the Lord are right, right? All the words of God are right, rejoicing the heart. Does the word of God rejoice your heart? Or does it sink you down in sorrow? Or does it just bore you to tears? David says it rejoices the heart. We know that when God speaks, he speaks aright. When Jesus speaks, we can trust everything he says. We're certainly not this way. And our words often don't rejoice the heart. We can be quite nasty and cutting and brutal in our words. We find in each other words spoken to harm and to hinder. But the precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, David writes elsewhere in Psalm 12, 6. This, Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. In the, in the commandment of God, in the words of the Lord, There is not even a whiff or a hint of evil or corruption. They are unstained. And so we can trust them. We don't have to worry. Is there some ulterior motive in God's commands? They're pure. Right? When we say something, there might be an ulterior motive. Why are we saying that? What's our purpose? What do we, what do we hold to gain? And maybe we are used to measuring other people's words always in this manner. Maybe we're used to. Certainly, if we watch television, uh, if we uh, listen to politicians, right, there's always an ulterior motive. What's the purpose? When we watch news media, even when we're reading social media posts that other people post, even if they're our friends, right? There's always some ulterior motive. We're trying to get something. We're trying to gain something. We're trying to belittle someone else and tear them down, right? But not so the words of God. There is no ulterior motive. They're pure. There's no evil in them. And, and understand this, right? 
that there are many who believe that the commands of God are an evil thing. Why do I emphasize that? Because there are those who think that the commands of God are evil. And when they hear something like, thou shalt, or thou shalt not, to use the King Jamesian, they hear words of oppression. God's oppressing me. God's hurting me. He's harming me. He's hindering me. He's not letting me be true to myself. They hear words which are unsavory and unkind. And yet what they fall into is that trap which Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 28 to 32. Romans 1, 28 to 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And listen closely. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Those who reject the commands of God reject life. They reject the goodness of God. They reject that which would enlighten them. And instead they approve and applaud those who are like themselves. And in this, friends, we must watch. For when the world applauds us, when they are not offended by us, we must realize that we have come to the ways of death. Such is the path of ruin. The commands of the Lord are good. And they give us insight for life, right? That's what it, that's what it says there in verse, the end of verse 8, right? They enlighten the eyes. They enlighten the eyes. The words of God are a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. They show us the way to go. They enlighten us. They make the simple wise. And why can we be so sure of this? Because they come from our creator. Realize that they come from the one who made us. God knows best always. And here's the blessed thing. God has not hidden all his thoughts to us. He spoke. He spoke to us that we may have words of life. He spoke to us that we might have wisdom. He spoke to us that we may know him. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Son of God, Jesus the Christ, he spoke that we may have life, abundant life, eternal life. It behooves us to listen. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Right. So this fear, the, the rightly revering of God, this is a spring of everlasting happiness. And anything less than rightly revering God and chasing after other things is a counterfeit joy. It leads to a counterfeit joy. We find only vanity. And we would do well to remember what is the difference, right? That which endures forever, or that which is temporary. Uh, we look to the words of the Apostle John in 1 John 2, 16 to 17. 1 John 2, 16 to 17. For all that is in the world. Listen to this. For all that is in the world. You want to know uh, what, is, what is around you? What is so emphasized by your friends? What is so... Uh, lauded by your co-workers for all that is in the world the desires of the flesh 
in the desires of the eyes and pride of life. And that last one, pride of life there, probably something like uh, rejoicing pride in materialistic possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So you can seek after the things of this world and you seek after vain things, counterfeit joys. Or you can seek after the God and His Word and find in it everlasting, everlasting life. That which will stand forever. Isaiah 48, the grass wither, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. You want something that won't uh, go out of date it doesn't need to be updated. You don't have to trade in and trade up. Look to the word of God. And now I will renew the question I asked at the outset. What do you think of the word of God? What do you think of his commandments? Do you value them? Are, are you with David when he says these things here? What he has described for us. And before you give a hearty answer, really stop and consider that question. Consider this. Does the time you spend in the word reflect the truth of what David says? Does the quality of the time that you spend in the word reflect that in them our life? Right. So it's not just that we spend a lot of time in the word, but it's also that we seek to understand it. We study it. We set aside time for it. Time without distraction. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I know, uh, at least for myself, that there should be some shame in the answer to those questions. We should feel shame for the ways in which we avoid the Word of God on a day-to-day basis. And we should repent of the ways in which we do not seek it, value it, or treasure it. Because it is the perfect Word. And yet, how quick we are to run and read other things. How quick we are to pick up our phones and spend countless hours, mindless hours on social media. And I know those things are easier, right? Those things are easier. They don't don't require our engagement. Social media brings us death. The word of God brings us life. What should we seek? Pick up the perfect word. Go to the word and study it, right? Meditate upon it. Think about it. Seek God in his word. Seek to know him and understand him. Ask of the passage of scripture reading. So how do we do this? How, what's an easy way to, to begin in this, right? Ask of the passage of scripture reading. What does this passage reveal to me about who God is or what he has done? Go and get some golden sweets. And what I mean by that is consider what David writes about next. The sweet word, the sweet word in verses 10. And 11, 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, right? It, we, we must ask here about our estimation of the value of the word of God. Because if we have determined that what, what David has written here is true, that it is pure, righteous, good, wise, enlightening, reviving, enduring, that the, they really are the words of God, then what he now directs our attention to must also be true. So he writes of gold, he says, even of the purest gold, that which would make one rich and enjoy all the finest things of life. There is much value in gold, even in our day. And its uses extend far beyond just adornment, right? We don't just wear gold, but we also use gold. Uh, And we use gold, for instance, in in computers and smartphones. So it has a lot of value. And in preparing for this, I looked up the current exchange rate. For one ounce, which is about the same weight as a AA battery, in case you're wondering, or a pencil, or a CD, but you know, I know that's like an old-timey thing, right? That goes goes in the shelf with uh, VHSs. But about about that weight, if you had an ounce of gold, you could have about $1,644.05. That's a lot of money for a little tiny bit of gold. It's precious. It has its uses. But the word of God is 
more valuable than that. It's to be desired more than an ounce of gold, more than a ton of gold, which, by the way, if you had a ton of gold, that'd be $52.6 million worth of gold. And the word of God is worth more than that. And David goes on to describe, right, it's, it's sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So it's sweeter than honey, right? This is the sweetener they had. It's sweeter and brings greater delight than the sweetest substances on earth. Xylitol has nothing on the word of God. Right? Do, do we believe that? Because at this point, we might think that David is overemphasizing, right? That he's speaking hyperbolically, that he's exaggerating. But no, remember what he has just said about what the word is, what God's law is. Gold is fine, but it cannot buy you eternal life. Honey is satisfying, but it can't restore your soul. Calvin writes here that of the word of God, that it may not only subdue us to obedience by constraint, but also allure us by its sweetness. In other words, right, the, the law, the commandments, right, constrains us. It has every right to. It's a commandment. That's what it does. It causes us to obey. God commands. And guess what? You have an obligation to obey. You are commanded something. You obey. God as creator can and does set the terms of creation. So we are obligated to heed his commands. But what Calvin points out there and what David points out here is that there's more to it than that. The word of God also lures us. It woos us. It entices us to come to him. As uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 34, 8, Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Or maybe we talk of love in 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God commanded, but God also loves. And what does that love compel us to do? Well, John adds in verse 11 of chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Is that interesting what, what John does there? It says the love of God allures us. And what does it allures us to do? To show that love to others. And John also in the same letter, right, he says that you know this commandment, love one another. We are commanded to love one another. But we all are also allured to love one another. Allured by our God. Do you see the sweetness of the command to love our brother is found in the sweetness of God's word of love to us? Why then do we look upon the word of God as something that is a burden? Because we've failed to comprehend, as David has sung of here, we have failed to understand the grace of God towards us. Because, friend, outside of the work of Christ, you are dead in your sins and trespasses. You are without hope, and indeed the only hope you have is your sure judgment, that God will punish you for your sins. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made a way. He sent his son, born of a virgin, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Jesus Christ came and perfectly obeyed the commands of God and died in the place of sinners that you might understand, that you may know the sweetness and the surpassing value of God himself, of God's words towards you, of Christ Jesus himself. Listen to these words of Paul as he writes to the Philippian Christians. In Philippians 3, 7 to 11, and understand the context of the book of Philippians. Paul is in jail. He's been put in jail for preaching the word of God. Let that color your thoughts about this passage. Philippians 3, 7 to 11. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith 
that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Do you see what, what Paul declares about Jesus there? Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Is that your experience? Brothers or sisters in Christ, is that your experience? Would you say that you would pay anything, anything, and everything in order to know Christ? Is Christ of surpassing worth to you? Oh, may we all count this world and its treasures as loss because we understand the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. And maybe we even share in his sufferings. Maybe we become like him in his death that we may attain the resurrection of life. David continues in verse 11, Moreover, by them is your servant warned, Right? Here's the reality. The reward of perfect obedience is eternal life. But none of us can do that. None born of woman can do this. We fail to obtain perfect obedience. We can only be assured of our judgment in that second death. As it remains that we need Christ's righteousness, there is yet hope. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. That the word of God transforms us the sweet word does it allure you do you hear in the word in the pages of scripture in the words of god the whisper of the voice of god enticing you alluring you wooing you with his love are you even listening for it Let's see next the convicting word in verses 12 to 13. The convicting word. And if we grasp something of the greatness of the word of God, then it must make us think of our errors, right? As David does here, who can discern his errors? And even in some of the questions that I've asked of you today, we find our faults. And what David means here by errors are all kinds of sins, all kinds of faults, not just little ones. But these are all kinds of transgressions. Uh, all kinds of iniquity. And David asks, who can discern his errors? And, and in this we confess. We have to confess. This, who, who we are in Christ, we confess. We cannot. We can't discern our errors. Because sin runs deep. Our sin nature, our natural disposition, our sinfulness permeates everything we think and say and do. We are corrupted to the core. And there is more sin in you than you can imagine. But David prays, and so ought we. Right? This is, this is what he takes up now in these next verses. He prays to God, and what does he pray? First, he starts off and says, Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Give me forgiveness, Lord God, from secret sins. Because there are sins we do without even realizing it. Right? There, there, are, there are sinful thoughts that we have that pass through that we don't even think about. There are sinful words that escape our lips that we don't even comprehend how sinful they are. Right? Our, our words are to be used to build others up, to bring grace. Do our words always do that? And are we always conscious that our words aren't doing that? There are things we do that are sinful that we don't even realize it. Maybe because we're ignorant of the law. Or maybe we're just blind to it. Do you understand that there are things that you think and say and do that are a friend to a holy God and you are not even conscious of them? And worse, and you might say, well, what could be worse than that? Worse is that there are times when we recognize sin as sin, but we don't even have a comprehension of how evil it really is. We downplay our sin. We say, oh, it's just, it's just a little, 
a little bit, a little thing. Right? What do we talk about in our culture, for instance, uh, with adultery? It's just an affair. Doesn't that sound fun? Although I don't really like the fairs, but certainly not the rides. The food these days would probably kill me. But anyways, right? But we talk about, right? We belittle our sin, right? We don't say we're liars. We just tell little white lies. That's all they are. They're not big evil lies. They're just little white lies. Come on. You got to give us a little credit for that. We let our that lustful look linger a little too long. And I've heard someone say this before. I'm just checking out the menu. Right? We, we belittle our sins. We, we lessen our sins. We say it's just a little bit of gossip. It doesn't really hurt anyone. It builds morale. And we don't realize that the littlest of sins, as as R.C. Sproul describes, cosmic treason. There is no little sin. It's sin against the holy God. And as we saw in James, right, to break one sin, to break one bit of, bit of the law, is as if we broke the whole. Because we sinned against the one who gave us the law. Right? The law is not just this patchwork of different people coming along saying, hey, here's what I think is best. The law was given by one person, the Lord God. To break one law is to break them all. Even the littlest of sins is enough to condemn you for all eternity to that place called hell. And so, do we have secret sins? Yeah. Sins we don't even recognize as sins, and worse sins that we know are sins, but we belittle and lessen and don't think much of. I dare say we do not think much uh, in such terms because the reality of these sins are hidden from us. And so we ought pray as David does, acquit me of hidden faults. Forgive me, Lord, of secret sins. He continues on, he says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, right? He doesn't, David doesn't stop at secret sins. He also cries out and says, keep me, constrain me, Lord, right? What is David praying for? He's praying for constraining grace that he may be avoid willful sin. He says, God, don't let sin have control over me. Calvin comments here, unless God restrains us, our hearts will violently boil with a proud and insolent contempt of God. And that applies to a believer. Unless God constrains you, believer, your hearts will violently boil with a proud and insolent contempt of God. Unless the Holy Spirit empowers you, unless you walk in the power of the Spirit, you will find yourself committing great evils against our God. So we need to ask God for forgiveness, right? We need to go to God and confess our sins. But we also need more than that. We need to ask God for the grace to not sin. We need to pray as David does, keep me back from presumptuous sins. Keep me, Lord God, from willful sins. Lord God, do not let sin reign over me. Indeed, we could go to uh, Paul, Romans 6, verses 11 through 14. We could spend a lot, of times, a lot of time in Romans talking about this issue of sin's dominion, sin's domain. But just this one, Romans 6, 11 through 14, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, consider yourself dead to sin. And some 
maybe walking, some of you listening, maybe walking in a season in which sin seems to have the upper hand, where every time you turn, there it is again and again, and that you cannot help but obey its passions. But pray to God this very day, this very moment even, what David prays here, and keep praying it until God delivers you. Keep me back. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. And let them not have dominion over me. God will give the grace that he requires. Trust him for it. Pray he grant it. This is the convicting word. And it ought us make us consider anew what God has spoken to unto us, what he requires of us, what he woos us to, right? Because it's not just about uh, this, this pain of stopping but the delight of something better, right? It's not just that we are are morose, sad, depressed people going about saying there's no good in life, that we have something better. We should rejoice more than the world does around us because we have the rejoicing that endures. And finally, let's speak the acceptable word In verse 14, the last part of David's prayer here, the acceptable word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. What we speak matters. James tells us of that in James 3. What we speak matters. Go there, look it up again, read through it this afternoon, remind yourself of it. What we speak matters. And from whence speaks the mouth? From out of the heart. Jesus tells us as much in Luke 6, 45. Luke 6, 45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Do you want to know why you say what you say? It comes from the heart. It comes from what you're meditating on. It comes from what you're filling your minds with. Fill your mind with junk. You're going to get junk out of your mouth. That applies in so many ways. What are you taking in? It's going to be what you put out. David's prayer is this. God, may the things that I think on be acceptable, be approved by you. And that reflects in my words. May they be too acceptable. They go together. So what are we to think on? Paul tells us, Philippians 4.8, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Do we do that? Do we practice that? Do we strive for that? Do we think on true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy things? Do you think on vain, vapid evil, untrue things. And when our minds are fixed upon God, when our mind is fixed upon his word, his ways, the good and pure, then our words will be the more acceptable. Or at least it'll certainly be easier to speak that which is true and in love when our minds are fixed on Christ. David desires that his ways be pleasing unto God. Happy is the man who seeks to please God in all his ways. Right? That's that's what he wants. He wants his life to be acceptable. He wants to be happy and rejoice in the Lord because he knows that's the way. He wants to bring God glory. He wants to fear his name. And to such a man as that, God will indeed be his rock, his strength, his redeemer. And in this, David expresses his confidence in the way in which God will certainly deliver him, shall certainly answer him. So David, throughout this psalm, has called us to consider the glory of God. He has considered the wonder of God about the only God. Creation declares and professes the majesty and might of God. And the word of God stands as a special testament to the righteousness, to the holiness, to the goodness of God in his ways. The word of God applied to our lives transforms us. How invaluable the Bible is to us. 
because it is a place in which we can uh, find everlasting joy, eternal life. It reveals to us the wonders and glories of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I ask again, beloved, what do you make of the word of God? What does the way that you spend time in it say? When's the last time you got lost in the pages of a good book? When's the last time you got lost pages in the Word of God? The Word of God has within it all we need for understanding who we are, who we are to be, who God is, and what He requires. But all of this is for naught if we have not the Spirit of God to to illumine our understanding. We can have all the knowledge of the Scripture, but if it never makes it to our heart, then we are as lost as the person who never opened their Bible. You can hear sermon after sermon, but unless you are born again, born of the Spirit, you have no hope. So what can a person do? Pray to God. Pray to God for the Holy Spirit. Pray to Him in faith, believing that He is who He says He is. Pray to Jesus Christ to save you, because, friend, you must repent. You must turn from your sins and look to God. You must confess, tell the truth of your willful sins and admit that there are more hidden faults in you than you know. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He did indeed come in the likeness of men, that He did live without sinning, that He died on the cross, not for sins He had committed, but for your sins, that He rose from the grave and that He ascended to the Father where He now waits to come again. And if you believe in Christ Jesus, if you look unto the word of God and treasure and value it, you can have eternal life. You can be forgiven of all your sins. And once that has happened, immerse yourself in the word of God. Seek to understand it. Meditate on it much. Think about it. David says, I meditate on it in the night watches. Day and night. I think about it. Memorize it. Yes, you can memorize the scripture. It's not just something that people did in olden days of yore. Something we ought to do today. And if it takes you a month to memorize a single verse, take the month to memorize a single verse. Memorize the scripture. And plant it deep in your heart. Cherish it for the invaluable treasure that it is. Because it speaks of our Creator's love, of His justice and holiness, of His might and His majesty, of His wonder and beauty, of His mercy and grace. Let's pray. O Father in heaven, forgive us. God, forgive us of our sins. God, forgive me of my sins. God, such is, such is our sinfulness that every time we turn around, every time we look, every time we, we stop and consider our lives, we see the weight of our sin pressing against us. Father, we confess, as the psalmist does, that if you were to call us to account, who could stand before you? And the answer is none. Because there is none holy as you are. Save that one man, Jesus. Father, forgive us. Forgive us anew for failing to to seek you, to love you, and to worship you. Forgive us, Lord God, for, for treating your word as a tawdry thing, as an add on to life. God, forgive us. Forgive us for the full weight of our sins. And Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this invaluable word because we know that in it, it has been revealed to us who your son is and what he has done on our behalf. We thank you, Lord God, that you have not set us to pay for our own sins that you have made Christ Jesus our propitiation, that he has borne the wrath we deserve. Lord God, we thank you. 
And we pray, Lord, that this word, that your commands, that the, that the law that you have given unto us, that that yoke which uh, Christ Jesus bears with us, it's light and easy, and in it we have life. Oh, God, grant us life. Father, we pray that we would value your word. We pray that we would understand it and seek to know it. Father, we pray that it would become increasingly more important to us. For it speaks of you. It tells us of your great love, of your glory, of your might. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. And help us, O oh Lord, help us, we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen.